the uh, hatcheries that produce PLs in the US. Um, our company is called C Products Development, and uh, we have a big farm. We used to have a big farm, and I say used to have because we were destroyed by uh, Harvey, and one of the biggest indoor in, uh, farmers, recirculating farmers in the world. Uh, we were about eight acres, and um, everything was uh, under a roof. And um, we produce about um, half a million pounds of shrimp a year. So that's who we are. Everything was non-discharge, RA system. So it can be done, but it takes a lot of sweat, a lot of money, and uh, a lot of hair, as you can see. So anyway, so I'm going to go forward. So I'm going to explain a little bit. And I include Lorenzo Juarez because he helped me with some of the pictures and everything. So he's a very good friend of mine, and he used to be the president of WAS. And, um, and I, I, I think, I want to say that in this room, there's one, a group of the people that they have done aquaculture industry, not only in the US, but in the world right now. So take advantage of that. So I'm going to go forward. Next one. So, Normally, how you assess a puzzle hour quality, and normally this is very important for the people because everybody talks about post larvae, and I received my post larvae, they were good, bad, or etc. So, normally, the hatchery or whoever is delivering your animals, they have to have a SOP that really makes things clear for the farmer who's getting the animals that they are receiving the best quality of animals. And they have to um, make sure that they are able to do all these processes before the animals even leave their facility. So we have, uh, normally what a catcher should do, okay, is they should ex do the external quality. And first they do by doing a stress test. And I will go through this a little bit more later on. The gill development, they have to check on that. They have to do an average weight on the uh, CV. And they check the activity. So if all of that is not met, the animal should not leave the facility. Then on the microscopic evaluation, you have to go into really what's going into the animals. I mean, seeing what's, what you have with the animals and the batch you're producing. You can see all of this. I mean, you can see deformities, you can see the necrosis, fungi, molting problems, bacterial, internal, external. I will go again into a, a little more detail into each one. And I'm giving you these tools a little bit if you receive pulse larvae, you can check on that yourselves too, okay? And uh, fouling and the gut content is very important. So I'm not going to go in a lot in detail in each one because it's going to take me hours to explain the, the whole SOP. But normally this is a standardized stress, a stress test that normally has to be done in order to see if the animals are going to be able to resist transportation, is going to resist the change of temperatures and salinities in your different environments that they are going to be shipped to. So later on, yes, I'm going to leave the presentation. If somebody wanted, you can go with Andrew and you can have it. Then on yield development, you have to check. This is very important. People tell you that I'm going to tell you PL12, and maybe it's a PL7. I mean, what it is, is really you have to measure this, the age of the animals mostly by a gid development or a rostrum formula. If you don't do that, you're only measuring by the days that the animal became a PL, that's not reality, okay? So, and this is crucial for the shrimp because all the osmotic regulation becomes on the, on the gills. And if the gills are not properly developed and you receive an animal that does not have this kind of, the, I, Jesus, sorry. Uh, they have this kind of development, then that means that your animal are not strong enough to be able to do the osmotic regulation to go to lower salinities, harder waters, different, that's where they do all their chemical processes. So it's very important for the shrimp to have this before they even be shipped. So you can assess this if some of your peels, people that they are sending animals to you, if those animals don't met with this, you can say, hey, my animals even got this, okay? So, again, you can have the presentation. The other part is we do a measure of at least 25 animals. It's a random sample, and you have to check the length also. That also tells you 
if the animals are growing properly. They can be developing good on the, on the gills, but if they don't have the land, that means there's some um, animals that they become in midgets, and maybe they will have issues in the future too. And then you do this, your CV. Your CV has to be in a certain range. If it goes really separated, then you're going to have issues too, okay? And I will, later on, you will, I will explain you how we evaluate those issues. So this is one of the important things once you do in a hatchery is you have to check those levels when it's a PL10, PL11, everything, what's a range acceptable? But that makes a lot of sampling in your own hatchery to really see that those animals are reaching those levels. The other one is the activity. I mean, normally, obviously, when the animals are cold and you receive them in the, in the bags at 18 degrees Celsius, obviously those animals are not going to be very active. Once they become to the temperature at least 22, 25, if you swirl the container, the animals love to go against the current. So they have to be going against the current. If they are settling in the middle, that means something is wrong with the animals, okay? Either the, the, the shipping was not right, maybe the animals were not strong, something. But activity is a very major issue that we also test when we are checking the animals. So I'm going to go in details now on microscopic evaluations, and a lot of people don't see those, but I mean, I love to, I love my microscope, so. Um, normally in that, these first slides, even though it's not a post larvae, I'll, I'll say, I've seen this in, in, uh, in post larvae. Uh, what you're seeing is the HP, and normally the HP should be in, in the form of a heart. So you have to have four lobules here. And in here you see already it's missing one. You're going to have problems with that PO. The next one is you have these kind of deformities. That's a, an issue that normally you get it when the animals get um, a molting problem. They molt and they leave part of the, of the skeleton in it and it makes a deformity on that end. This is another same issue, but got, got constricted over there. And that's all the other one, that the spines become really tangled together and everything. So that's going to become an issue later on. Obviously, these are, all of these are soya stages mostly, but you can see some of the things in the post larvae too. The other part we're looking is into necrosis. Uh, necrosis is a result of a lot of things. It can be your bacterial loads on your system or in the system, in the hatchery, or in the animals that they are arriving is because they have a, a lot of bacteria and the bacteria start eating through the animals, creating necrosis. The other part is cannibalism. Maybe the animals were not fed correctly and maybe packing too much density and they start eating each other and then they become infected. And you can see a high magnification of that. And um, all these necrosis that you, you see here is mostly caused by bacteria here. How you know it's bacteria in this case is very simple. Is because this is complete. This, this, this is completely, and it, the bacteria is already going into the, into the animal. This is another appendix that has been already gone out. This could be cannibalism, but it's not because you're already seeing the bacterium problem here. This is another issue. This is mostly cannibalism. They cut the eye and then it's going to be necrotic, and even if it molts, it's going to show necrosis. And this is another one that maybe a lot of people will see an animal like this and say, hey, this guy is eating. It's not. All this is necrotic. All the HP is completely necrotic. There's nothing inside. There's no lobules. All it shows that bacteria is embedded in there, and it's already necrotic, this part. The other part will be fungi. Sometimes you will see this kind of fungi, uh, it's a um, langenidium, and you will see that it's spreading through the shell. This is, you don't see it normally in post larvae, but if you see it, it's going to be, this is a very aggressive animal, a thing, you have to really control it. There's chemicals to, use it, to do that and to avoid that, and normally the hatchet should not send you animals like this. So this is a higher magnification of langenidium. Other issue is molting problems. You start seeing animals that they have the, the shell, and then they stay with the shell together. One of the main reasons that happens is mostly it's, they've been, um, there's three reasons. One is 
they were not acclimatized properly. The other one is the feeding is not being done correctly, so the animals are not fed. And the other one is you have a chemical problem. So when the animal goes into this situation, obviously molting is one of the most stressful things for shrimp. So when they go through that, even though you see the animal fed and moving and all that, it's a dead walking animal. It's going to die. It's not going to survive. You don't see it right now, but you will, maybe in three or four days, your population is be, going to be 25% of what you have. This is another example of molting problem, and this is another magnification of that molting problem. It stays, sticks in here, and then creates all these deformities in the animal because it's like somebody put a glove when you were a baby in your hand, and then your, body, your hand stays very small, okay? Obviously, the major issue is bacterial loads. And uh, thanks to, um, to the probiotic industry, I mean, the aquaculture, we, I don't have to go into this a lot because probiotics have changed the way we do aquaculture. In the old days, running a hatchery with bacterial loads was just a nightmare. I'm sorry, I'm giving your, my back to you guys. Um, so normally, uh, bacteria used to kill everything. You can lose a tank larva rearing in about two hours if you were not properly, it was not properly managed. And even if it was properly managed, if the conditions were proper for the bacteria to get in, you can lose everything in two hours. So at that time, we used to check the animals every two hours, 24 hours a day. I can tell you it was not a fun job to do. So you have to check all the tanks. So Bacterial loads internal create a lot of issues. And this one is a bioluminescent vibrio that normally was caused most of the mortalities in Asia in the, in the hatcheries. So it was, it, it was a big concern at the time. So this is one of the effects, one, some, one of the disease that it was called so yet to syndrome and it affected the industry for years. And it, it was also a, a um, a bacteria, a vibrio, like affecting the HP. And normally, if you see the animal here, if you didn't detect the animal on time, you see these are lipids. So it's feeding, but you see the, the HP is beginning to be double, like increase, it's inflammated, all the membrane around the stomach, of the, about the HP, I'm sorry, not the stomach. In here, you see what happens next. So. The HP, there's no lipids anymore. The HP is getting thicker. And so the digestions and everything going in here is not happening. Why? Because bacteria here is releasing the toxin and it's creating um, a problem for the shrimp. Then after that, you start seeing in here is what they used to call the, the bolita syndrome because bolitas in Spanish means bulls. You start seeing these little balls, and a lot of people thought they were lipids like this, but you see the difference. They have no color, and they, don't, they are not spherical. That means that the stomach start falling apart, the whole HP start falling apart and clogging the whole gut. So all the movement of the gut was clogged, and the animals start dying. I'm sorry, I know it's too technical. Um, then, if you didn't do anything, it continued to this, that the HP start to disappear, and then you create the necrosis that I showed you before. The other part is, in the old days, they start creating like these anti-stress formulas and all that, start helping a lot before probiotics came in. Now probiotics help if you control them really good, you will not even see that. Immediately you see recuperation of the, of the gut, and here you see the, these little balls that I was telling you that they were part of the stomach, but now they are moving and there's some filtration coming through and then the animal recuperates. All right, so bacterial external um, also has to do a lot how you, the density of your tanks and how you manage them. So when Robin was saying that the hatchery is not an easy thing to do, it's not. It's just a nightmare. I can, I can assess of that. So I'm sure I have killed way more animals than you. So. <laughs> <clears throat> and here you can see a lot of, we call it falling. Normally you will see a lot of algae and feed and everything attached. But what really creates this is this little critter, is Langenidium. Langenidium is a filamentous bacteria that attaches mostly to the gills. And it's so, 
I will call it sticky, that sticks everything around it. And what happens is asphyxiates your shrimp, and then you will not be able to, you will not be able to molt and die and blah blah blah. So all these things have to be assessed on the animal. So when we're talking hatcheries, hatcheries have to be very careful in everything that they do in every single of their processes. Falling. Falling can be done by a lot of things, nematodes, bacteria, protozoans, and other parasites, okay? So, in here you have an animal completely falling, and you see how the animal looks. It's, I promise you it's alive, okay? But if you receive something like this, there was something really wrong in the culture system, okay? This still alive, okay? but it's completely clogged by these nematodes. And the other one is a langenidium, that's a big one that exists everywhere. And these are, and here it used to be a video, but you can see these thing, critters moving everywhere. These are nematodes. So when you're creating an environment that is so rich in nutrients, obviously even though all the filtration you do, all the water quality you do, all the technology you do, if you're not careful in how you manage it, you will get easily contaminated by anything. So this is a list of species that you can see that they are falling, just to give you just a broad example of that. And then the other part, the part that really mostly concerns you. Um, so when you receive animals and you're stocking and you're receiving animals that they've been stressed, they're coming out from a long, long, transportation area and everything, they've been through a lot of stress. So normally people bring the animals, they're stressed, they're okay, they are alive, they are moving, they're nice, and, and they have some God, but they are almost empty, okay? Then after five hours, you start seeing some recuperation. 12 hours, 24 hours, you can see the animals, the gut is more full and everything. 72 hours, now you see an animal beginning to have lipids everywhere, and five days. Why I'm putting this? Because a lot of people receive a shipment, and they say, hey, I got great survival, I stock it. But you don't know if your animals were good or not. It takes about five days for the animals really to recuperate from the stress of all that. It does not take two hours. It does not take the time you acclimatize the animals. It takes way more than that. It takes five hours. That's why I love nurseries. I, I don't have a graph here, but that's, that was another presentation I did in another panel. But for me, showing you my results on the farm versus my results with the nursery on the farm, you can see that all the, in the old, you know, that time when I did that presentation, I had survivals in the ponds at the beginning from 45 to 85 percent survival. Those were my results. When I put the nursery, all my results at that time were 65 on the farm steady. But on the nursery, I had 20 to 90 percent survival. Why? Because the nursery absorbed all the problems from the pack out. And it's easier to contain the problem in a nursery than contain it Five minutes? Oh my God, I only halfway. Uh, all right, I'm, so anyway, my point is that you guys should have a nursery. That will change everything on what you're doing. And if you want to claim that something was not good into your reception or your animals, the only way to assess it is five days later. So you need to contain those animals in a place for five days to see that your survivals on those tanks were good before you put them in your ponds. Because when you put it in your ponds, you're going to lose them. It's going to take at least until the animal is two grams or three grams, maybe a month after you stock them to really know what your survival is. Okay, so I'm going to go faster now. All right, so this is normally a, a page that shows me, at least on my hatchery, what I do and tells me if I, I'm able to send these animals or no. So you can read it later on. I'm not going to go into specifics, but they need to reach this, I need to have that score higher than 50 in order to be able to send it. If I don't have higher than, than 50, I don't send, those animals should not be sent because the results are going to be bad. 
because on top of that, I'm going to put a lot of stress into the animals that they're shipped. All right, so let's go into the business. So U.S. demand in the U.S., at least till 2016, this is the demand that we had. So indoor porns normally is about two to three million post larvae a month industry, okay, at this point. A lot of things are changing. There's a lot of companies in Canada um, and Minnesota trying to make a bigger indoor shrimp farming that's going to increase those numbers. But normally, the steady production from January to December is about two to three million PLs. That's it, okay? So when people tell me, hey, we should have more hatchers in the US. Okay, well, two million post larvae, it's about four, income, Gross income will be about $15,000. So I wonder who can, what kind of biologist you can pay with $15,000 and you're not even putting your costs. So that's something we have to think about, okay? If the industry does not grow, the problem is the egg and the, and the chicken, who comes first, you know? So the other, part, the other issue in the US is demand. You have a lot of demand in March, April, May, and June. Okay, mostly March, April, May, and May. Those months, yes, you can make a killing, but you're not going to run a hatchery during those months and then close it out the rest of the year because that make, does not make sense. So the only real hatcheries that can do this, the only people right now, with this, the, the way the industry is that can do that is that is companies that they are doing putting a hatchery because they have other business attached to it. Either they have a farm and they need those post larvae to put in their farm like us, okay? Or they have a genetic program that they are selling broodstock and they are compensating that with the sale of PLs. Or they have something else. So in my point of view, putting a hatchery just to make a business is not a good business yet, okay? Now, the industry in the U.S., I think, is going to move towards these indoor systems, and I think I don't, I don't see it any other way. Why? Because everything Robin said before. The price point in here, people want quality shrimp, fresh quality shrimp, and made in the U.S. Yes, you can make a killing on the income, but you have to be very uh, careful on how you produce it, how you do it, and how you, how you process we started with the farm only, and we started buying BPLs at the same time. And it was a nightmare for us. Then we put our hatchery, and then we did a genetic program. All that combined took us a lot of years to develop, and on top of that, now we have a processing plant, and we do value-added product. If not, it was very hard to survive. So, who produces PLs in the U.S.? Okay, SIS has been the facility that mostly has been providing PLs for years. So SIS had a monopoly until 2014. Why? Because they not only control the, the, the PL market in the continental USA, but also con the, the broodstock. Nobody can produce a hatchery without broodstock, so they, they control that. So until, until after a couple in that year, a couple companies came by and they started producing broodstock and PLs and they started opening that market. One was us, one was another company. So normally if to, to, until 2017, SIS produced about 20 million per month, okay? We produce about 20 million per month. So that's all the sales that they were in the U.S until 2016 and early 2017. Then what happened? We were hit by a hurricane, so we were out of business for a while until we re rebuilt the whole system. And SIS was hit by, a by, by another hurricane three weeks later. So obviously that collapsed the industry, and not only in the US, it collapsed the industry in, in Europe too. So, because we were the sole providers of PLs to them. So that opened a lot of opportunities for other people that they were trying to get into the market and also make it start making sense to them. So now we have American Penade, again, Robin's new company, on that end, that he's going to produce about 30 million PL, uh, PLs per month. 
Bowers, which is the biggest shrimp farmer in the U.S. right now, after he struggled all last year to be able to get PLs, he started producing his own hatchery, and he's um, planning to finish this hatchery by the end of this year. Trans-American Aquaculture is a new company that it's in South Texas, and they are uh, rehabilitating a lot of ponds. They are saying that they are going to produce 100 million a hatchery putting 100 million because that's what they need. Now remember Bowers and Transamerican, that's, they are putting that amount of um, post larvae per month because they are, that's what their own personal needs on those high months. Now Bowers will be able to do it because Bowers have a processing plant that normally during the months of PLs, they, are, they, don't, have, they don't produce a lot because it's low season. And then when they harvest, normally they put all the people from the hatchery into the processing plant. So they will be able to make a business out of that. Transamerican, I don't know what they're doing to do. And now there's another company called North, North American Broodstock that I have no idea what they do. So they say, they claim they are selling PLs and they claim they are selling Broodstock, but I haven't heard from them, so I can't tell you that. So going to my last slide, and you're seeing me like very stressing out. You're stressing me out. So... Um, 2014 post larvae production was monopolized. In 2015, hatcheries were it started to become we were, and it was a fight to come into into this business, and that allowed to be open, more competitiveness, and people start producing broodstock too. So we have more more areas. Then we were a hit, and now there's more expansion. Blah blah blah. I'm not going to go into that. So just. My closing, closing thoughts is um, having a hatchery is not the biggest business. I think the most important part is a long time ago, one of my teachers said, when I was young and beautiful, um, the, he said that aquaculture in the U.S. was meant to be, at that time, was meant to be mostly scientific and do, we we're, were going to do the Brewstock business which, funny thing, is true. 90% of the world production of shrimp coming f is coming from most, well, not 90, how many, like 70% of the aquaculture production comes from broodstock from the U.S. And all started years ago in Hawaii. So his dream come true, that, but I don't agree with that. I think at that time, with the resources we had, that was true at that time. Now, with that technology, that genetics, and what we're doing in close recirculating systems, I know it's possible. Now, it takes a lot. Believe me, it's not opening a, a, a swimming pool in the backyard and just putting shrimp, and then you're going to get production. It's, it takes way more than that. So just fasten your seatbelts and have fun. <laughs>